Welcome to Taste of Truth Tuesdays, where we'll be serving up bite-sized conversations on all things fitness, nutrition, mindset, and spirituality. So grab your headphones and get ready to taste the truth with us every Tuesday. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast platform because every bite counts. Hey, hey, welcome back to Taste of Truth Tuesday. This week, we're diving headfirst into the turbulent intersection of women's suffrage, the resurgence of Christian patriarchy, and the trendy trad wife movement. You better buckle up because as always, we are unraveling so much here. We've got the historical battles. We've got modern movements that are colliding. We're going to be revealing their surprising connections from ongoing struggle for gender equality. So prepare for a journey through past and present that challenges your conventional wisdom and ignites critical conversations. In recent months, we've been exploring how radicalization, conspiracies, and religion have shaped my life. And in episode five, we tackled the crunchy hippie to alt-right pipeline. But it is time to shine a light on the radicalization of the left, a topic often overlooked. Why did I go from progressive circles to mingling with Trump supporters and Christians? This radicalization was marked by a range of events and trends that were reflecting broader shifts within the progressive movements. Let's break down a couple of them. We had the Black Lives Matter protest and social justice movements, which were ignited by George Floyd's murder. But what I don't hear discussed enough is that BLM faced scrutiny over fund management. There were allegations in around 2021 that financial mismanagement by the BLM Global Network Foundation and critics were questioning how substantial donations were actually handled. And then we had the defunding of the police, which gained momentum during these protests, and interpretations varied what defunding the police meant, leading to significant public debate. And we had cities like San Francisco, which initially reduced police funding, were facing rising crime rates, and then reinstated funding in 2022, acknowledging that some of the defunding measures had not achieved the intended outcomes. Two more things I want to talk about. We saw increased political activism. So we saw the intersectionality and identity politics thrive in 2020 and the rise of online activism. So social media platforms were becoming central to the political mobilization and the debates over this ideological purity and inclusivity. I was getting harassed by so many friends. I had moved from Portland, living in New York, and they were like, how dare you not use your platform to speak out against all this stuff? I mean, I was getting bullied in the DMs. I had no idea what was happening. That leads me to the last thing I want to talk about. The role of cancel culture and accountability, as they like to call it, became so prominent with these debates, whether it's public figures or, you know, smaller influencers for their perceived offenses, you would get completely harassed. And I think this suppresses free speech. And while a lot of these liberals and leftists see it as a necessary tool for social justice. So vaccine hesitancy, you know, it's interesting. Prior to 2020, skepticism was often associated with certain liberal or more progressive groups. I guess you could call them the OG hippies. They were the natural health movements who preferred natural remedies and had a strong distrust of pharmaceutical companies. And there was environmental and organic lifestyle focuses. So that was who was hesitant towards vaccine prior to 2020. And that was the group I was in. I was reluctant to receive an experimental vaccine, which led to severe ostracism. And those of us who were hesitant towards the vaccines or mandates, we were dehumanized, we faced cancel culture, we were labeled anti-science or irresponsible, and this harsh treatment stifled constructive dialogue and alienated individuals with genuine concerns, highlighting how cancel culture can suppress a nuanced and much-needed debate. Speaking of which, just in July of 2024, Dr. Stanley Plotkin, who is a prominent figure in vaccinology, and some of his colleagues published an article that has been drawing significant attention. And you want to know why? Because it acknowledges that vaccines are not thoroughly studied as previously claimed, particularly in terms of safety, both before and after they are licensed. And this has been what we've been saying all along. Key points of the article include admission that pre-licensure clinical trials often have limited sample sizes and short follow-up periods, which may not fully capture long-term safety data. Additionally, there are currently no dedicated resources for post-authorization safety studies, relying instead on annual appointments approved by Congress. This lack of resources for ongoing safety monitoring has been criticized by many of us as inadequate, particularly given the widespread use of this medicine. This confirms our concerns that vaccine safety has not been thoroughly investigated as it should be, and this was not 
how the conversations were going down in 2020, 2021. And this leads me to the crunchy to patriarchy pipeline. In that previous episode I mentioned, episode five, we just scratched the surface of the trad wife and stay at home girlfriend movements. These movements were advocating for traditional gender roles. They see them as spiritually fulfilling and empowering while rejecting modern feminism. We discussed the fear tactics with this online content that manipulates users by promoting apocalyptic scenarios and moral decay. And we're going to be exploring this topic extensively today. But before we talk about the 19th Amendment, I want to take a detour and explore the evolution of kitchen design. The kitchen has long reflected changing gender roles and societal expectations. So we have post-Civil War in early 20th century from 1865 to 1930s. So after the Civil War, kitchens transitioned from being managed by enslaved people to paid workers, with labor-saving appliances emerging and the housewife ideal taking shape. In the mid-20th century, from 1930s to 1960s, in the post-World War II era, which emphasized suburban living and reinforced the housewife's role. It's also known as the mid-20th century ideal. This is where the role of the housewife became a central cultural ideal driven by post-World War II economic prosperity and suburban expansion. And this was shaped by a couple things. The post-World War II boom allowed for folks to move out of the cities and with housewife becoming a symbol of the American dream. The suburban home was seen as a sanctuary with the housewife managing domestic life as its center. Media and advertisements reinforce this housewife ideal, portraying women as devoted homemakers. Shows like Leave It to Beaver celebrated this role, emphasizing this role is desirable and fulfilling. We had these rigid gender roles that were defining the housewife as primary caregiver and homemaker while men were made the breadwinners. Women faced significant pressure to conform to this ideal, with career aspirations often seen as secondary. And last thing I want to mention was the impact on women's rights. So the feminist movements in the 1960s and 1970s were challenging this ideal. They were advocating for broad opportunities for women and critiquing this narrow definition of women's role. In 1974, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act was passed, granting women the right to open bank accounts and obtain credit cards in their own names. This landmark legislation was a significant step towards financial equality, allowing women to build credit and manage their finances independently of their husbands. And so today's trad wife movement is going to glamorize the mid-century housewife as a personal choice, not a patriarchal trap. But let's be real. This nostalgic comeback is less about empowerment and more about rolling back feminist progress. And we're going to talk more about that while cherry picking conservative values. So it's definitely time to call out the toxicity and acknowledge that a nuclear family ideal doesn't have to be a patriarchal prison. So let's connect women's suffrage to Christian nationalism. This week marks the anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which is a massive milestone for women's rights. As we know, this did not grant all women the right to vote because many women of color still face disenfranchisement around this. But we want to talk about the rise of ideologies challenging this progress, such as Nancy Piercy's claim that women's suffrage was a net loss in her recent book published in 2023, which reflects a broader trend of dominionism and Christian nationalism. Here is Dr. Nancy Piercy herself on The Spillover with Alex Clark. So we we get women's suffrage. Now looking forward all these years later where we are now, do you believe that women's suffrage has been a net negative or a net positive for society? Yeah, that's a big that's a big um that's a big question. I think it's been a net negative to go from the household vote to the individual vote. Piercy claims the reason suffrage for women has been a net negative is because of the shift from the household vote to that of the individual vote. She seems to perceive the ideal voting system as the household vote, male heads covering female and child dependence. One of the things that makes Piercy compelling is how much she gets right. But at the same time, she is historically off about some things, too, sort of like Dan Brown in The Da Vinci Code. I will link an article from Dr. Beth Allison Barr, the author of The Making of Biblical Womanhood, who explains a lot more in depth. So back to Nancy. So her book, The Toxic World Masculinity, which was embraced by right-wing fundamentalist figures like Elisa Childers, Natasha Crane, Frank Turek, Greg Kirkle. I mean, she was going on the rounds. I saw her on so many different podcasts. It only socially validated. I was like, wow, this book is the shit. Obviously, I need to get it. Yet, it's been criticized for its logical fallacies and misrepresentation of the research. So in this book, Piercy argues that the expansion of women's roles and rights has led to a war on masculinity. And she's promoting these gender stereotypes and overlooks a lot more perspectives. 
Critics like myself point out the biggest offense is Nancy's misuse of John Gottman's research. It was extremely misleading. So to quote John Gottman, he says, Complementarian men only do well when they don't act out their hierarchy and put aside their beliefs. Nancy pulled these findings, citing that in both egalitarian and hierarchical marriages, emotionally intelligent husbands have figured out one big thing, how to convey honor and respect. She argued that labels don't matter. And I'm like, Nancy, absolutely not. She omitted to mention that the biggest finding in Gottman was he framed the entire chapter saying that men only do well when they put aside their beliefs. So you can't claim that complementarianism are irrelevant by quoting someone who found out that acting out these beliefs is actually disastrous. This is only one of the major criticisms of the book pointing to the lack of empirical evidence to support the claims made, particularly regarding this alleged war on masculinity, and I think we should consider the consequences of promoting ideological narratives without empirical support. These views reflect a broader conversation within conservative Christian circles about gender roles. I want to talk about Joel Webin and Doug Wilson for a second. These are two of just many figures that argue political rights for women undermine traditional values and family structures. Their arguments are part of a larger critique within the conservative narrative and communities that see these modern advancements in women's rights as threats to perceived biblical order. So here is Christian nationalist pastor Joe Webin. Wave your Christian nationalist wand. We wake up tomorrow in a Christian nation, a Christian nationalist nation, as you're describing. All right. There's a lot of fears that people have. Here's one of them. Will women have the right to vote tomorrow if you wave that magic Christian wand? No. Okay. So this pastor, Joel Weapon, emphasizes traditional gender roles and views women's suffrage as a deviation from biblically mandated roles. And similarly, Doug Wilson's complementarian posits that women should remain in traditional domestic roles, critiquing the expansion of women's public and political presence as contrary to biblical principles. Here is a quote from... Doug Wilson of Canon Press, he said, of course, he's for religious freedom. Of course, non-Christians would be allowed to exist and thrive in America. But Wilson argued that things would be way better for everyone if we would just take steps towards effectively declaring the U.S. as a Christian nation. I have one more quote from Pastor Joel Webin for you. Four people in my life that I dictate the hours in their day. I dictate what time they go to the bathroom, when we eat, what we eat, what we wear. This is not fringe. This is very common rhetoric in the conservative Christian circles. The Southern Baptist Convention had a conservative shift, and we saw the rise of what we call the New Calvinism, which further pushed this trend because both movements emphasize male-led church governments and promote traditional gender roles. We talked about this in my disentanglement episode. It's like the only episode that's left from season one. We talked about the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, which was established in 1987, and the New Calvinist movement, which emerged in the 1980s, which were reinforcing complementarian views and contribute to the rise of dominion theology and Christian nationalism. I want to talk a little bit more about the motivation behind these movements. So we've talked about embracing traditional values. So supporters aim to uphold stability and traditional family roles and they value a nurturing home environment and support their partners as household leaders. There's a huge movement of rejecting modern feminism. Many of these folks view modern feminism as anti-family and undermining traditional values, preferring roles that they see as empowering. Fear tactics are super prevalent in this online content. It's always promoting worldly dangers, apocalyptic scenarios, spiritual consequences. We see these narratives within the culture wars, which often lead to anti-LGBTQ or anti-feminist sentiments, and it's always using fears of societal collapse and moral decay to urge followers towards these conservative values. We saw this happening during the satanic panic in the 1980s and 90s that were stoking fears of occult influences. And that's really similar to what we see today, right? In recent years, evangelical communities are super pissed off about like Harry Potter and witchcraft or rock and roll music and the secularization of media. I mean, when Patrick and I were in evangelical Christianity, we canceled Netflix because of how it promoted the agenda. And of course, they want to call out folks like Taylor Swift or Lady Gaga for promoting values that are contrary to traditional Christian teachings. And I mean, I remember the day that I was drawn into evangelical Christianity, and it definitely wasn't through logic or a carefully reasoned argument. It was through the power of a story, a testimony to be exact, and the speaker shared a dramatic tale of transformation from the depths of despair and darkness into the light of salvation. Ah. 
Of course, her voice trembled with emotion and tears were glistening in her eyes as she described this overwhelming peace that she had found in Jesus Christ. I was captivated. And it wasn't just a story. It was basically a call. It was a plea for me to experience the same miraculous change. And this manipulation was subtle, but powerful. The emotion stirred within me. Man, it was so intense. It was definitely overwhelming. I felt a sense of urgency as if my own life depended on making the same decision that she had. It's like I could feel the darkness closing in on me, and the only escape was to step into the light that she described so vividly. Fear played such a significant role in this manipulation. I was warned of the dire consequences of rejecting this path, of eternal damnation that awaited those of us who turned away. The fear was not just for my soul, but for my life here and now. I mean, I was told that without Jesus, I would continue to live in confusion, loneliness, and despair. What made it all the more compelling was this promise of belonging. I had always felt somewhat out of place with BPD, but ever since becoming a military spouse, I was extremely disconnected from those around me. And here was this community that promised acceptance. It was like a family where I would always belong. When I came out on my Instagram page about getting my first Bible, I think I got about like 26 DMs. The love bombing was so insane. That's where I was introduced to the concept of biblical femininity and submission. And that was shown to me as a path to fulfillment. It was like a way that I could finally fit into the role that had been designed specifically for me by God. It was like, this is why your life is disaster, Megan. You were a feminist. You were going outside God's order. And this is why your life sucks. I had had abortions. I had been a sex worker. And I was told that embracing my role as a submissive wife and mother is how I could find true happiness and purpose. Man, looking back, I realized how these tactics really exploited my vulnerabilities. I mean, Patrick and I were all caught up into actually trying to have a baby when honestly, when I ask myself, I've actually never, ever wanted to be a parent. The emotional manipulation, the fear-based messaging, and the promise of belonging were all tools used to mold me into something I wasn't. And they weren't really concerned about my true self. They wanted to shape me into their image of the ideal Christian woman, submissive, obedient, and unquestioning. What's more disturbing is how these tactics aren't unique to evangelical Christianity. I've since learned how similar strategies are employed in other religions such as Islam. I'm sure you're like me and you've heard that Islam is the fastest growing religion. Well, have you looked into the Pew research into why? Well, there's growing pressure within some Islamic communities to recruit other women. They shower potential converts with love, bombarding them with messages of acceptance and sisterhood. It's all designed to draw them in and to make them feel special and chosen. And once they're in, the pressure to marry and fulfill their role as a wife and mother can be so intense. Just as I was drawn into a community that promised to complete me, these women are often led to believe that their worth is tied to their role within the family and the broader religious community. The parallels are striking. Both exploit the human need for connection and purpose. Both use emotional manipulation and fear to control and convert, and both lead to the loss of self, where the individual's identity is lost by the demands of the group. As we wrap up today's discussion, I want to dive into the complexity surrounding Christian interpretations of morals and values, particularly through the lens of historical and cultural relativism. So scholars argue that the Bible, while revered as the inspired word of God, is just a product of its time, influenced by the cultural beliefs, social norms, and theological biases of its authors. This perspective is going to challenge the notion that a single Unchanging divine revelation, which is univocal, highlighting that the human elements have actually shaped this text transmission and interpretation, which is multivocal, meaning many voices have formed the text of the Bible. And this leads us to question the reliability and the authenticity of the biblical manuscript, since we don't have the original copies. We only have variations, discrepancies, and textual corruptions over time, which have complicated our understanding of the original intentions of the Bible's authors. And such concerns are underscoring the difficulty of maintaining a singular authoritative stance in a text that has undergone numerous revisions and translations. Challenging the concept of biblical inerrancy, which is a concept that was developed in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, is crucial for everyone that is in this deconstruction process. You know what I found fascinating in my research is that in 1978, the Chicago Statement was made on biblical inerrancy, which basically codified evangelical leaders that declared that the Bible is without error in all of its teachings. I have a pretty long post that I'll link in the show notes where I talk about the harmful effects of biblical inerrancy, but one of them is moral absolutism. So it promotes this black and white view of morality where complex ethical issues are often oversimplified, leading to judgmental attitudes and a lack of empathy. 
And that leads me to a contentious issue of abortion. The selective interpretations of scripture that are used by pro-life Christians will illustrate a broad trend here of reconciling faith with personal and social values. So historically, Christian views on abortion were much more diverse and often more permissive. Before the 1970s, many Christian denominations, including some Protestant groups, had a much more lenient stance, allowing for abortion under certain circumstances. This perspective was influenced by a range of factors, including the earliest 20th century feminist movements and evolving attitudes towards women's rights. However, the landscape shifted dramatically in the 1970s with the Roe v. Wade decision and the rise of the religious right. Evangelical leaders and conservative Christians began to adopt a more uniform anti-abortion stance, framing it as moral and political battle. And this realignment marked a significant departure from previous more nuanced views on abortion. Last week, Neil Van Leeuwen pointed out an intriguing observation that the pro-life stance might often function more as a signaling mechanism than a genuine, consistent commitment to protecting life. He noted that while pro-life evangelicals seek to pass laws protecting unborn embryos, they often avoid practical measures, such as universal daycare, that could significantly reduce the number of abortions. So this dichotomy suggests that the pro-life advocacy might sometimes serve simply as a symbolic gesture, as a way to signal group affiliation, rather than fully integrative moral commitment. This illustrates the ethical and scriptural inconsistencies surrounding the pro-life stance, and so by examining this, we can gain a clear understanding of the challenges inherent in reconciling pro-life advocacy with practical, compassionate approaches to supporting life. When we talk about the trad wife controversy and traditional values, these movements will definitely resonate with some as empowering choices, and the Ballerina Farm controversy illustrates this perfectly. Ballerina Farm is a social media phenomenon which showcases the ideal version of traditional domestic life, which aligns with the trad wife movement. So Jessica Reed Krauss, also known as House and Habit, shared her analysis of the Ballerina Farm, and she was saying that Hannah's story isn't about regression, but it's about choice. She embodies a version of success not measured by corporate titles, but by personal contentment and family harmony that is at the core rooted in her faith in God. Ultimately, the real goal of feminism should recognize and respect the diverse paths women take. Critique should foster understanding rather than perpetuating division. So House and Habit argues that Ballerina Farm presents traditional roles as voluntary and desirable rather than acknowledging their roots in patriarchal structures. And so while I definitely think this perspective is important, but it's also crucial to consider the role of patriarchal norms within such movements. Consequently, practices that may seem problematic to outsiders, such as Daniel's rushed engagement or his control over Hannah's education, are often normalized within their cultural context. These actions reflect a much broader adherence to patriarchal values, including homeschooling with the Christian Mormon syllabus, which will definitely underscore their commitment to traditional gender roles. And another layer of this discussion, recent research into Mormon influencers reveals how the LDS church is using social media to attract new recruits. Influencers, particularly families, are employed to promote Mormonism through platforms like Instagram and YouTube, and this strategy capitalizes on the appeal of traditional family values and domestic harmony to attract a broader audience. This interplay we're seeing between traditional values and modern media is illustrating a broader pattern within society. And I think often patriarchal norms are defended as personal choices, overlooking the deep societal influences at play. And if the gender roles were reversed, these issues might become much more apparent, prompting a need for more nuanced discussions on how traditional values intersect with contemporary gender dynamics. Because let me tell you, from my own experience being involved in evangelical Christianity, I was in a biblical counseling program that reinforced the patriarchal control and really limited my autonomy. In a workbook, I was given a specific excerpt from The Excellent Wife by Martha Peace. She was talking about 18 ways a wife may be the glory of her husband. And here's nine aspects from the sheet. Number one, ask your husband, what are your goals for the week? Number two, how can I help you accomplish these goals? Three, is there anything I can do differently that would make it easier for you? Four. Be organized with cleaning, grocery shopping, laundry, and cooking. As you fulfill your God-given responsibilities, your husband is then free to do his work. Five, save some of your energy every day for him. Six, put him first over the children, your parents, your friends, jobs, ladies' Bible studies, ETC. Willingly and cheerfully rearrange your schedule for him whenever necessary. Seven, talk about him in a positive light to others. Do not slander him at all, even if what you are saying is true. Eight, 
Do whatever you can to make him look good. Accomplish his goals. Some examples are offer to run errands for him. Organize your day to be available to help him whenever possible. Pray for him and make good suggestions. But give him the freedom not to use your suggestion and do not be offended if he does not follow it. Last example, consider his work, jobs, goals, hobbies, and work for the Lord as more important than your own. Alrighty, let's unpack this. First off, The Excellent Wife by Martha Peace is not just a French book. This is a central resource within biblical counseling. The Southern Baptist Convention, the largest denomination in America, and many non-denominational churches use this book. This ideology may not come always from the pulpit, but it is perpetrated through counseling sessions, women's groups, and community teachings. It is woven into the fabric of many church communities, making its influence pervasive and insidious. This book puts idolatry of the husband. This belief system equates that obeying the husband is basically obeying God, placing the husband in the position of an idol. The wife is expected to glorify her husband as if he were a mediator between her and God. This is crazy. It subordinates divine will to a human figure, distorting the very essence of spiritual faith. There's no room for a wife's autonomy or moral agency in this construct. Her purpose is solely to fulfill her husband's desires from the trivial, from what to cook, to the profound, such as disciplining their children. This dynamic is not only spiritually harmful, but also socially regressive. Two, this book teaches a warped view of womanhood. The idea that women are inherently more susceptible to deception or that their rightful place is akin to that of a slave who should expect no recognition. The excellent wife goes as far to say as labeling basic human desires like wanting to be treated with kindness as idolatrous. This not only devalues women's emotional experiences, but it also perpetuates this toxic culture where women are shamed for seeking fairness, respect, and kindness in their marriage. But worst of all is how it enables abuse. This is the most alarming aspect. This book glorifies suffering within marriage as a form of righteousness. Women are encouraged to endure cruelty, manipulation, and even marital rape as part of their divine duty. The emphasis is always on submission and forgiveness, with little to no guidance on how to set boundaries or seeking safety, man. The position that divorce is a rebellion against God and makes church discipline the first recourse instead of contacting authorities. The excellent wife traps women in dangerous and often life-threatening situations. And again, this is not French. Here is John Piper, a very popular Calvinist theologian. And I think she endures verbal abuse for a season, and she endures perhaps being smacked one night, and then she seeks help from the church. Here's a quote from J.E. Adams, the founder of ACBC Biblical Counseling. Abuse is not among the legitimate reasons for divorce found in the Bible, and separation is never an option. John MacArthur, megachurch pastor from Grace Community, has been under major scrutiny since March 22, and we've had eight women say that church leaders instructed them to submit to their abusive husbands rather than report them to authorities. That story is really dark, and I'm not going to go any further, but I highly suggest looking into it. Here's a quote from Vadi Buckman, who is a very popular pastor within the conservative evangelical community. Quote, abuse. There's a person who's in an abusive marriage. That's not biblical grounds for divorce and remarriage. Okay, I just was trying to make my point that this is not fringe at all. So back to the book, Excellent Wife. It stigmatizes mental health care, equating seeking professional help with a lack of faith. This approach diminishes the importance of therapy and potential medication, suggesting that prayer and biblical counseling are the only faithful options. This is exactly what I was told. This is the hole that I was dying in. And by doing so, it was alienating me from getting the essential support that I needed that could actually help me navigate the emotional and psychological challenges that I was having. And so the bigger picture here is that these ideas may seem well-intentioned at first, but by doing so, it alienates women from essential support systems that could help them navigate emotional and psychological challenges. They perpetuate a system where the wife's identity and her value are entirely lost and are under her husband's goals and his image, and the directive to manage household's duties meticulously while saving energy for her husband only enforces this expectation of this endless emotional and physical labor without reciprocation, which basically erodes a wife's sense of herself and isolates her from any other potential support. Man, the dangerous implications of this theology are not confined to the overtly religious communities, though, because of my research on the country hippie to alt-right pipeline and the intersection of crystals to complementarianism, I found similar themes of female submission 
but the most common thread was the rejection of modern egalitarian values in favor for the constructive ideal of natural order, which often misses the deeply patriarchal and oppressive beliefs. So I really think that this trad wife trend isn't just a nostalgic yearning for the past, but it's a deliberate effort to reinstate rigid gender roles that diminish women's rights and freedoms. And we need to critically examine resources like the excellent wife and draw connections to the broader social cultural trends. And we can better understand and then challenge this insidious nature of this propaganda. I think it's why it's so important for those who are still in the church. Hello, if you're listening, it's so important for you guys to stand up against these harmful teachings. If you want to learn more about this, I'm going to link a podcast in the show notes so you can. Let's connect the dots from Ballerina Farm to my biblical counseling experience. As I mentioned earlier, we have conservatives defending Ballerina Farm and saying that feminists should want to protect the women's right to choose to do traditional roles like Ballerina Farm has supposedly done. But what I wanted to share here is that many of us who have come out of these fundamentalist, high-control environments reveal that there is a different story going on behind the scenes. Gender norms that emphasize tenderness over assertiveness will hinder a woman's ability to assert themselves and address unfair treatment effectively. Women submitting to their husbands is a dangerous ideology. Let's review what the research has to say. A major cause of sexual mistreatment is societal structural inequality that gives men power over women. In fact, the IFS report showed that conservative, highly religious men were far more likely to perpetuate intimate partner violence and a meta-analysis of 39 studies found that hypermasculinity was one of the most profound indicators of men's likelihood to commit assault. Pastors like Mark Driscoll, John Piper, John MacArthur, Stephen Furtick, just to name a few, emphasize traditional masculine characteristics while downplaying traits that they perceive as soft or non-conforming to traditional gender norms. So hypermasculinity within the church takes various forms, but we can see them emphasizing aggression, promoting the idea that men should be aggressive, assertive, and dominant, which I think leads to more conflict and hostility. Instead of understanding and compassion, there's a preoccupation with power and control, focusing on maintaining this in the church hierarchy rather than promoting humility, servanthood, and cooperation. I could go on, but here's Mark Driscoll himself. And the problem in our day is not toxic masculinity. It's the complete lack of masculinity from the White House to the outhouse from to- Or we have huge Christian influencers like that girl named Blake making posts saying weak men create hard times while talking about problems in the Middle East. The reinforcement of these rigid gender roles can perpetuate a cycle where men and women will struggle with different aspects of emotional health. Men are going to face challenges with expressing vulnerability, while women are going to struggle with assertiveness and setting boundaries. Last little fact I wanted to share is couples where the husband's dominated decision-making processes were 2.6 times more likely to experience lower marital satisfaction compared to those who made decisions collaboratively. And this is why abuse is so common within the church. It's the theology that's bad. It's not just how it's interpreted. I personally think that the liberation of women from oppression is crucial for fostering a more equitable and just society. When women are fully liberated, they can contribute all their talents, perspectives, skills to every aspect of life, including politics, economics, and culture. I mean, this liberation not only benefits us women individually, but it also leads to societal progress by dismantling systemic barriers and promoting inclusivity. You know, I want to open up the dialogue about gender, family, and cultural norms. Let's discuss. I mean, have you observed or encountered any of these dynamics that I've been talking about? Because, you know, I think as a collective, we definitely cannot ignore the role of algorithms and how social media impacts us. These tools will amplify compelling narratives. They definitely create echo chambers that reinforce and solidify beliefs. In times of social upheaval, individuals are going to gravitate towards these conversion narratives that offer clarity, certainty, moral absolutes, because that's what we're seeking amongst the chaos. So the internet, man, it's good, but it's bad. It's allowed for ideological content to spread rapidly and globally. And we can look back into historical parallels such as religious revivals, and other political movements that show how persuasive narratives and charismatic leaders can shape public discourse and societal norms. Through my journey of deconstructing the abuse within the church, I found the Danvers Statement, which was written in 1987 in Wheaton, Illinois, that said the husband has 51% of the vote, ultimate responsibility, final authority. And even though they present this as a strong theological stance as ultimate truth, It is fundamentally patriarchal and a root cause of oppression and abuse. My experiences have shown me how this structure perpetuates unequal power dynamics, placing one gender above another. And navigating these dynamics is going to help us grapple with complexities 
of today's ideological landscapes. I think we all need to critically evaluate how historical precedents and technological influences are going to continue to shape our beliefs and societal structures. As we reflect on the progress made since the 19th Amendment, we must also remain vigilant against ideologies that seek to undermine this progress. Thank you so much for joining me in this exploration of faith, ideology, and societal change. Let's continue to question, reflect, and engage with the world around us. And as always, maintain your curiosity, embrace skepticism, and keep tuning in. Have a great week.